Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. We, as always, have a great webinar on tap today, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, you will be able to access the webinar on demand. A little bit later on today, we'll be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation, you have a question for our panelists, please don't wait, don't hesitate, just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your question. And we'll take a few minutes near the end of the presentation and go through those audience questions. We also have two polling questions during today's presentation, so we hope that you'll uh, take part in uh, the polling questions with us. And finally, near the end of today's presentation, we will be doing a drawing for five $50 Amazon gift cards. So stick around, stay through today's webinar, and we'll do the drawing near the end of today's presentation. And good luck to everyone. Okay, with that, we will kick off today's webinar, which is continuous delivery, the one question you must answer. Our speaker today is no stranger to the DevOps.com webinars, Wayne Ariola, who is CMO at Tricentis. Hi, Wayne, how are you? Good, Charlene. Where do I, can I also enter to win the Amazon gift card? I'm, I'm in. Yeah, I can use 50 bucks for Amazon. <laughs> you know, I think everybody could use 50 bucks, but unfortunately you are not eligible. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, well. Jeez, Listen, I'm, I'm doing gonna, all the work here. I, yeah, well, I, I'm doing a little bit of work too. So <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and put myself on mute uh, before I get myself into trouble and I'll let you get on with your presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Charlene. And thank oh. you to DevOps.com. Uh, I got to let you know, we really love uh, the product that DevOps.com is producing. There's so much great content, um, and I know I'm, I, I get lost uh, even looking at the great webinars that you guys have. Uh, so thanks for providing that service to our community out there. So um, thank you. If people are on the phone. Um, you know, welcome. Uh, I want to talk about continuous delivery, and I want to talk about the one question you must answer. Uh, this is one single question, and as you could probably imagine, it's going to probably get a little bit more complex, uh, but nonetheless. Um, we're going to start with with this idea. Let me just do a little bit of an intro, and Charlene already uh, uh, showed you this in terms of housekeeping, but two things I want to point out. Please ask your questions. Even if we don't get to the question during the webinar itself, I want to make sure that we get your question, and I promise you we'll respond back to you with your registered email address to the question that you, that you had asked. Uh, it's our pleasure to do that um, as part of uh, you know, of our community of, of DevOps practitioners here. Uh, the second thing is that I, I want to also point you to the Tricentis Resource Center, uh, which you can go to tricentis.com and resources. Um, DevOps.com is going to be the primary home for this particular uh, webinar, but uh, if you want to find it again, uh, we'll point you back to um, DevOps.com in our resource section. There's a lot of other cool stuff there. I'm going to refer to some other presentations there during the presentation as well. So I wanted to point out that link. So finally, a little about me. And by the way, I did this this morning. So forgive me for, for like a, a, a sloppy looking slide. So uh, I, I just wanted to find a picture. And I said, okay, I'm going to just do a quick Google search. And I, you know, I basically said, well, how many years have I been in this software testing space? And I started at, in the year 2000, and that's the way I looked in, in the year 2000. Uh, and as you can imagine here, uh, in roughly 19 years, I've gotten a lot more bald and a lot more fat. I apologize for that. Uh, but nonetheless, I, I've spent 19 years uh, really focused on the topics of software and software testing, and it's been a great journey. If you'd like to link or if you'd like to ask me any questions personally or, or link with me in LinkedIn or uh, have a conversation on Twitter, you can, uh, those are, that's the appropriate information there. So please don't hesitate to, to reach out uh, and it's my pleasure to, to spend this time with you. Um, if you don't know about Tricentis, just real quick, and this is the only thing I'm going to tell you about Tricentis, um, you know, we're in this business of software testing transformation. Um, we know organizations are going through a massive change. Uh, some organizations are behind, some are way ahead. 
but nonetheless, uh, Tricentis is there to assist you through uh, what we call a, a change process. And this change process is shifting to the concept of continuous testing. Um, Tricentis uh, has been growing tremendously over the last few years. Uh, over 1,600 customers worldwide with really the top organizations in the world uh, as our customers. Uh, we're the only company that is recognized by all top analysts, Gartner, Forrester, and IDC, as being a leader in the space. And, and the reason why we have achieved that designation is because we've delivered real results associated with the transformation of testing. And it's something we're really proud of. I would say as a vendor, we're one of the few vendors out there that realize that you need to change the way your people process and technology infrastructure uh, is currently operating in order to achieve the business results you, you desire. Uh, we're going to touch upon that for the rest of the conversation, but I just wanted to introduce Tricentis to you very, very briefly. So let's get back to it. Continuous testing, the one question you must answer. So first of all, the one thing that we have to talk about is that the role and responsibilities associated with software testing needs to change as radically as the business expectations associated with digital transformation, the evolution of DevOps, or even scaled agile, right? So in order to get to this concept of continuous delivery, we really need to understand that the business is morphing in really radical ways. And what usually happens with software testing is we trail, right? And we end up getting somewhat of a bad reputation for that. By the way, I'm so sorry for the 1980s Joan Jett reference. I'm sure none of you understand who this woman is jumping with a guitar. Uh, but nonetheless, she had this song that said, I don't give a damn about my bad reputation. You're living in the past. It's a new generation. And I couldn't have thought of a better way to, to encapsulate that because we really are in that inflection point where we're going towards this new generation of testing. And this new generation of testing has basically three components of it. It's speed. It's the understanding of risk, and there's breadth. I'm going to talk a lot about speed and risk today. Uh, I'm not going to talk about too much about breadth, but let me just touch upon it real quickly on this slide. Breadth today basically is this idea of the decentralization of architectures, whether it is SaaS-based, native cloud, or service-oriented, or microservice-oriented. Um, the concept of an application and the application boundaries are getting blown apart, uh, which means from a testing perspective, in order to accommodate the breadth of technologies we need to test across in order to exercise a transaction becomes imperative. So meaning you have to know a service, a service interface, uh, a application, a SaaS-based, a web, a, a, a cloud-based uh, native application, a, and then of course all your legacy applications. You have to understand the nuances of that in order to actually exercise a transaction and protect the business. So breadth today is becoming much, much more decentralized, which actually increases the scope of what we need to test. Okay, that's enough of what I'm going to say about that today, but I'm going to focus primarily on the speed and risk concepts here. And by the way, this shift has fundamentally been labeled today continuous testing. So what is continuous testing? So continuous testing, um, and this is the Wikipedia definition, so uh, there doesn't have to be any argument about this. This Wikipedia definition uh, has also shown up in Gartner and Forrester Research, so it seems to be the, uh, the kind of the central go-to for the definition of continuous testing. Um, I'm going to augment it a bit in a second here, but uh, continuous testing is the process, process of executing automated tests as part of the software delivery pipeline. And this is interesting because this is what's changed from test domination. In order to obtain feedback on the business risks associated with a software release as rapidly as possible. So let's augment that for our modern world uh, with two bullet points. So what we did as testers beforehand was to actually wait to test at the end of a cycle. And when we waited to test at the end of the cycle, we then shoved all this feedback to developers who didn't want to hear it. And uh, essentially, we, we, anything that we found as testers uh, only produced a roadblock for releasing the software. So guess what happened when we had all that great feedback at the end of the life cycle? Um, no one really wanted to hear it. The difference with continuous testing is to give the right feedback at the right time to the right stakeholder or for the right stakeholder, right? 
So the idea of providing the right information at the right time to people who can actually care and take action, and more importantly, they're prepared to take action on information, is the critical difference in the process that we need to evolve today. So meaning if we're running a really comprehensive regression suite very iteratively, yet we're reporting on parts of the code base that are not changing, that might have an error, you know what, the development team isn't really interested in that. They're, they're in the throes of a current sprint and they want feedback on what's going on in the current changing code base. So making sure that we got the right information delivered at the right time to the right stakeholder. The second point I really want to make is it can happen at any point in the service delivery lifecycle. And this is where our industry kind of got a little nutty on us, is that we basically said that continuous testing is synonymous with the concepts of shift left. And by the way, shift left is part of continuous testing, but it doesn't, it's, it's, it's not equal to continuous testing, okay? Meaning continuous testing, if you take the, the, the bullet above us that says the right feedback at the right time for the right stakeholder, right? It needs to happen throughout the, the service delivery lifecycle or the software delivery lifecycle, right? And it, it's gonna happen beyond that as well. So it gets into production. It monitors the information for production and feeds that back from a quality perspective. So the idea of continuous testing isn't just one phase, it's all. And when you hear people say it's shift left, just tell them they're wrong, right? And we're, I'm gonna tell you why uh, as we get through the rest of this presentation. So, but what's happened to our industry today, um, which is predicated on this idea of, of more and faster, is that this central idea of testing has been somewhat blown apart, right? So the central idea of having a test group in the middle as a center of excellence and the core delivery of all things test has, has been blown, up, blown apart and it should be blown apart, right? Because we said that in the definition of continuous testing, that it needs to happen across all phases of the software delivery lifecycle. And the, the general area where it's moving today is that we definitely see the DevOps movement shift towards dev test, right? Uh, we see still the need for a central group uh, in the middle, which basically is the owner of the transaction, meaning they look across application sets, pull together a test that allows us to actually test a transaction. And then finally, we're seeing a net new area open up, which is really more on the IT ops side, which is this the, the sophistication of testing, protecting that last mile, really, which is the difference between the pre-prod and prod, and what is going on there, and again, we're seeing that uh, element open up. This entire spectrum, by the way, as you can imagine, constitutes continuous testing. So, you know, what we're finding, by the way, is on the left side here in the dev test, this is really more of a bottom-up movement, right? Uh, this is somebody who is taking a sprint. Uh, they're testing somewhat myopically, but they're testing the changing code base, uh, and they're testing more bottom-up whereas the IT ops side uh, is testing more top down, right? Uh, seems logical. Uh, the people on the left uh, are really doing more progression testing, you know, focused on the changing code base, looking at the impacts of change, understanding how their current or new user stories have impacted uh, uh, or, or are working or not. And on the right, what we're seeing is more automation, right? We're seeing this idea of running the regression test suite against what the current expectations are of the system. Uh, we're also seeing the idea of RPA or robotic process automation start to infiltrate this area. Um, on the right, we're seeing more impact of the concepts of AI, machine learning, and more automation leverage to actually understand the impact of change. Whereas on the left, we're seeing obviously that there is more code, which is actually driving that instance. Just a quick note. Um, when you look at the entire spectrum of software testing, um, we have the idea of development testing, and then there's this idea of dev testing, right? So development testing, by the way, you know, your more traditional unit tests or using techniques like static code analysis um, have been practices that have been out there in the industry for years and years and years, but, but they haven't necessarily been as mature or enforced as they've come today. So the idea of testing as a central group came from the idea that developers really didn't want to test. 
So what we're seeing in our industry is, you know, really an evolution of all phases of quality across the entire uh, software delivery pipeline, which means that dev development testing, the honing in on best practices associated with code structure and unit testing uh, have begun to evolve as much as this idea of dev testing, which actually draws together much, much more uh, of a uh, abstracted view of what needs to be testing. And obviously all the way through to this idea of IT ops, which we're using much more automation, much more AI machine learning to assist us in understanding the quality of a release, number one. And number two, uh, get, starting to draw in information from production in order to hone or improve the way we're exercising our, our candidates for release. So imagine we have the entire spectrum of testing under change today. And it all started from this pod, which was this really centralized idea of test. So by the way, I wanna do a quick poll and I'm gonna introduce the, the answers to the poll in a little bit here. Um, but I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page on what I mean by these answers. So we get a good, good result from the, from the poll itself. So the question I wanna ask you guys is what's the role of software testing like in your organization today? Okay, so is the role of software testing more like a mission critical checklist for, for launching, right? Meaning that it is really tightly defined, it is highly automated, and at the end of it, you guys know with a, a maximum degree of confidence that you can launch a rocket. And when I say maximum degree of confidence, you gotta admit that launching a rocket comes with an extraordinary amount of risk and cost associated with failure, right? So meaning that this is the penultimate uh, software testing process, meaning that the mission critical checklist uh, provides the right data to the right people at the right time that gives you the ability to automate uh, this actual release and deployment cycle. Um, so is your software testing process like this or is your software uh, testing like traffic light? You know what, if there's a level of automation there, it controls the flow of how things actually get through your delivery pipeline. Um, yet, um, there's a lot of complexity. And by the way, with that complexity, you also find that uh, accidents do happen. So uh, if you take the first concept of how is your, your, your testing as being this highly coordinated mission critical process, this would be the next step down. We have some automation in place, that automation in place helps us um, helps us get to where we need to go, but there are accidents along the way. It's certainly imperfect, um, and, uh, but without those traffic lights, it would be an absolute mess. Or is your software testing process like going to the dentist? Meaning that, hey, look, I know I should be going to the dentist more often, but quite honestly, I don't have the time. It's something I can put off. And by the way, my teeth don't hurt that bad right now. By the way, this is the most awful picture I could imagine yeah, for me. This is, uh, if you look at this guy, he looks like he's in extraordinary pain. Um, but is your software process like this? Uh, are you, is it like going to the dentist where you realize that you need to go back, reevaluate your software testing process, uh, make the commitment to actually doing the task, uh, and know in the back of your mind that you guys are not doing enough? Or here's your last option, is it like doing your taxes? Meaning that you really just hate doing it and you don't really understand the measurable benefit in doing taxes in the first place. Uh, and basically it is a struggle and you'll leave it to the actual last moment. Uh, when I presented this slide before, someone actually said, hey, but Wayne, what happens if you get money back? And I said, that's the worst case scenario when you get money back from taxes. That means the government took it from you in the first place and you don't have the money in your pocket. So I stick with this analogy that top, the, lead, the, the bottom rung of this is like software testing is like doing your taxes. So let's shift over, Charlene, to the poll question, which is what is the role of software testing like in your organization? Mission All control right. checklist, traffic light, going to the dentist, or taxes? 
All right, it should be right there on your computer screen right now, so you can go ahead and make your selection. We'll give you guys a couple seconds, and while we're waiting or while we're going through this, I just want to remind the audience that if you have a question for Wayne at any time during the presentation, you can submit your question. You don't have to wait until we move into the Q&A section. So um, if you got a question, um, just use the questions tab in the GoToWebinar control panel and submit your question. Okay, Wayne, looks like we have about uh, almost three quarters of folks who have voted. So I am going to go ahead and close the poll now and we'll push out the results and take a look at them. Oh, where did it go? There it go. Okay, uh, looks like the majority of folks look, uh, look at software testing or it's like traffic lights. So okay. I don't know if that's what you're, uh, what you're seeing out there. That's definitely what I'm seeing out there. Um, I, 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 by the way, I'm unable to see the results. Is that uh, what you would expect? You can't see the results? No, but I'm just sharing my screen, so I don't know whether it's uh, okay. Yeah, right it's possible that it's 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 okay. So, so the uh, the results are 43% uh, answered traffic lights, 30% answered going to the dentist, and then 14% each. A listed mission, a mission control checklist, and doing your taxes. So the best and the worst, I guess, both both got uh, 14 percent. Uh, but that's kind of what I would expect. You know, it kind of <laughs> yeah. hovers in the middle. And uh -huh. um, but the traffic lights is you know certainly where we are. You know, we basically, if you look at the evolution of software testing, um, you know, we have put a lot of effort and and cadences into the process. Um, but obviously the concepts of continuous delivery and, and deployment obviously gets us into a much, much different uh, uh, scenario where you really want to get to that mission control checklist. Okay, that's cool though. That's what I would expect, but uh, thank you audience for participating. That's great participation in the poll question. That's cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so um, if I move on, uh, are you guys able to see my screen? Yes, yes, Charlie. yes, I can see you. Cool. Sorry, I put okay, myself cool. back on. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no problem. No problem. So thank you for uh, helping us with the poll, Charlene. I appreciate it. So, you know, I know you guys have all seen this concept before, but we know that delivery cycle time is decreasing and the concepts of continuous delivery and the concepts of continuous deployment, obviously, in your, your more advanced DevOps type processes are actually shrinking this, this idea of years, weeks, months, and days. And, we know that. We also know, and I mentioned this briefly at the, at the top of the, the webinar, is that the rate of change associated with technical complexity and technical breadth is also increasing dramatically. So, you know, the idea of your microservices environment now interacting with your legacy infrastructure uh, and uh, also interacting with the, uh, the, the array of endpoints or devices that you'll be managing um, uh, is is increasing, um, and now you're going to bring in concepts like IoT uh, or concepts uh, that even advance that with uh, with more real time computing or or robotics. Um, so the rate of complexity is also changing, um, which introduces this gap. And today that gap needs to be met by the concept of continuous testing. And and how did we get here? And it, you know just to draw this whole question together. Um, you know, we, we've known that over the decades of software uh, and hardware, we've seen that the system architectures have gone to a highly decentralized mode. Um, but if you look at your, you know, traditional mainframe that uh, was a single giant box on your far left to a microservices architecture on highly decentralized on your far right, you know, the way that these, these systems are being distributed or architected today uh, really have multiple pieces scattered around multiple areas. The interesting thing is that the dev team structure has traditionally followed the system architecture. Makes sense, right? Uh, not only do I need an organization that is able to understand the, the current nuance of the, the architecture, but they must deliver towards that architecture with software. So the dev team has basically somewhat mirrored the, the distributed nature of or the decentralized nature of system architectures. Um, however, what we're also experiencing today is that with dev team structures is that we might have gone too far. The pendulum might have swung a little bit too far 
in terms of decentralization, decentralization um, actually making the dev team a little bit too myopic in the component that they're delivering, whether it's an application, a service, uh, or uh, a, a, a grouping of, of, of components. Um, and, and that concept of how distributed teams have uh, become uh, has, has started to be challenged. And we're looking at you know, things now like tribes, for example, to start matrix, matrixing people back together. Uh, and it's becoming as complex as the system architectures. However, if you look at really the test team structure, the test team structure has lagged over time. Uh, we went from a highly centralized uh, group of testers who were responsible for testing itself. We moved into centers of excellence and then technical uh, or digital centers of excellence uh, to the ideas of the, the testers now being obviously uh, infiltrating and being part of the actual uh, delivery team itself. But the test team has always lagged behind the dev team uh, in terms of their structure itself. It's been a concept that usually follows the dev team structure. And this has really led to the current question that is being asked today. So in this presentation, I said, you know, the one question you must answer, this is the question we have been answering with testing which is, are we done testing? We've always asked the question, are we done testing? And the reason for this is kind of the, 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 the in the chart I just showed before, the distinction between the, the test team uh, catching up to the dev team in terms of the way it's structured, right? So we've had this idea of the, the testers uh, being somewhat separate. So the, the main question that was being answered getting to release was, are we done testing? So I'm going to pose to you that this question doesn't really add much value to anything. And the fact that it's the major question means that, you know, quite honestly, that we, we're mostly battling organizational silos rather than answering a business question associated with the function of testing. So what is the question you must answer today? It, I'm going to pose to you there's only one, and it's this one. Does the release candidate have an acceptable level of risk? This is the single most important question we could be answering today. And by the way, even though it's one question, it is absolutely loaded. With, it's a loaded question, right? So this idea of acceptable and this idea of risk really blows apart a, 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 you know, a, a very, very uh, unravels a ball of twine here uh, that is much, much more complex. Um, so we really got to get down to this idea of risk, okay, and what is the acceptable level of risk. Uh, by the way, the picture on the right uh, is of this guy named uh, Rex Pemberton, who I've had the, uh, the honor to get to know over the last few years uh, watching him speak at conferences. Um, but Rex uh, basically jumps out of helicopters with this, uh, this engine-powered wing on his back and goes flying around. Um, uh, let me just say that Rex or Rex's acceptance level of risk or his tolerance for risk is slightly different than my tolerance for risk, uh, if you can imagine. Uh, and herein lies the, the complexity when it comes to even software delivery. By the way, go YouTube uh, some of Rex's, uh, don't do it now, but go YouTube some of Rex's uh, videos. It's, it's just insane what he does with this thing. Um, but when we look at the, the release and what's an acceptable level of risk, it, you got to unpack it. And what it means is that we technically need to understand the risks associated with the business-facing components of our release or our release candidate. The second thing is that there's an understanding um, of the acceptance of this concept of risk for those components. And we've come to the conclusion as a team that we know how to measure it, okay? Then what we have is in order to move forward in more of an automated fashion, we have to set a baseline for what is acceptable. And then secondary to that, we have to understand the threshold for acceptance because we're never gonna be at the baseline, right? There's gotta be a threshold associated with it. And that's really where tolerance comes in. So we're gonna have to understand the tolerance for that. And then finally, we need automation in place to continuously assess 
the risk associated with, with the software we have under our management and development, right? And this has to happen continuously. And this means there's got to be an infrastructure or a continuous testing platform in place that allows you to exercise things in context of the, the conversation of risk. So let me let me kind of switch over to a interesting uh, uh, thing real quick. And first, let me go to this idea of the definition of risk. And this is what I use when I'm in front of clients and I'm talking to, to organizations, is that in terms of software, business risk is any application shortcoming that impairs the end users or customers' expected experience, okay? The expected experience. And this is interesting because your application might work amazingly, but quite honestly, the expected experience because the competitor out there in the marketplace is doing something faster, better, cheaper, um, basically can distort what the your end user's expected experience is. And this delta, it basically, uh, or ultimately, erodes confidence in the business, right? Not erodes confidence in the application. You know, when I get mad at my banking application um, not doing what I ask it, to, ask it to do, it's it's not that I get mad at the app, right? My My confidence does not erode in the app. It erodes in the bank, right? Because I can't just stay with the bank and switch out the app. I got to switch the bank, right? I got to switch that uh, that idea of where I'm actually getting the service from. Um, so this idea of the expected experience is is really critical to to where we're going today, especially uh, with digital transformation. Let me now shift, take that concept of risk and the business impact of risk, and let me shift to uh, a survey that we did in 2018. So I drove this survey in 2018. Um, which was a survey around the future role of a tester. And in one of the questions we asked out there is, do tests accurately reflect business risk? Okay. So let's, let's start from the bottom of this chart and work up. So if, I, if you look at the dark blue, um, that would say, no, tests do not actively reflect business risk. And if you look at the middle, it says, yeah, they kind of do average. And if you look at uh, uh, on the end, yes, they do. That would mean that the tests do accurately reflect business test, business risk. Excuse me. Um, if you look at the consultant and individual contributor, which this individual contributor is someone like us, testers, right? Um, the consultants I basically identified as people who are uh, testing or as part of the testing process, but they are part of a larger uh, global uh, system integrator or system integrator. Um, they have, you know, great confidence, roughly, you know, 43, 44 uh, percent saying that their tests do act actively or accurately reflect business risk. However, if you start looking at the manager and the senior managers, this delta starts to arise that only 14% of senior managers think that testing active, accurately reflects business risk. And only 22% of managers feel that tests accurately uh, reflect business risk. This is a pretty major delta, right? Meaning that the people doing the work think that they're doing, not, you know, you know, not a bad job. Whereas the senior managers are showing the fact that they really don't understand the concept of business risk as being reflected through those tests. This is the gap and the major gap that we're seeing today in terms of the evolution of tests. And we see it manifest itself in a couple ways. As people responsible for software quality or testers, this is basically our inability to really bridge the gap between business language and technical language. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, reflect on that in a moment here, but this is a telltale sign that quite honestly, we're not reporting as accurately as we could be in business terms, because quite honestly, the level of test automation has increased and improved over time, but I don't believe we're able to accurately reflect that improvement to let the business know that we're doing a better job. And what we really need to do is, is quite complex. So if each one of these balls represents, you know, a risk or a grouping of risks that are currently in your application itself, getting a handle around the scope and complexity of what we're trying to manage is quite a daunting task. Uh, and primarily what we end up doing is focus primarily on what's changing is that's functionality. And from that perspective, we're looking at, uh, you know, maybe unit testing or UI testing to assist us to understand whether the functionality planned is, is the functionality that's being delivered. But in, in 
total uh, concept, there's a lot of other concepts out there that erode a end user's confidence in our application. You know, there's things like scalability, accessibility, understandability, testability, configurability, st stability, all the illities, all these non-functional requirements out there that also impact the aggregate or total user experience. The one thing after looking at this slide that I began to realize is, is if you look at all these illities and you take the business user's uh, understanding of what these things could be or should be, they don't get it. The mere fact that our language from a testing perspective has become complex means that we've drawn farther and farther away from explaining to the business user the impact of our, our, our releases and the impact of our contribution of testing uh, or test. And we need to get a handle on this or we'll never be able to move to more advanced levels of automation, okay? Um, this is the main point I wanted to make with this slide. But we know that in reality, quite honestly, as we are trying to achieve uh, greater and greater levels of test automation, um, we understand that as we go through each sprint, um, through the, look at the yellow box here, um, our incremental tests are growing, and they're growing at a rapid rate. In some sprints, we might not add too many additional tests, but on other sprints, we might add m more tests. But what we're going to realize with an application or a transaction set over time uh, as we get to the, the release process or the, the tail end of a release, what we're going to find is that we're going to hit a critical limit. And the idea here is that given what we've built from a testing perspective is we're, we're not going to have the time required to actually exercise everything um, we, we need to exercise. And the time needed to actually exercise everything we built is really going to be infinitely larger than the time available or the resources allocated to us, which means that we've got to try to make trade-off decisions. And those trade-off decisions are tough because uh, you've got the changing code base, right, or the changing functionality that we know we want to hone in on. But we also got to understand what the impact of those changes are to the broader trans application set or the broader transaction size. So we got to start making trade-off decisions. And this is where the idea of really understanding risk comes into play. If we understand things as low risk, where we don't necessarily need to invest time, or medium risk, where we can do it if we have time, or high risk, which is our business imperative, we know we can actually hit timelines and deliver the business the right feedback or the most critical feedback at the right time, right? So having this idea of risk associated with your test suite becomes much, much more of, a, of an imperative as you begin to actually expand the number of tests. And, and by the way, there's another concept that we're going to hit here as we go along here. But also with this idea of your regression test suite growing is the idea of your, your regress suite regression test suite also being bloated, um, meaning that there is significant duplication in what we're seeing out there in, in, in test suites. And, and this is also something that we must handle. Um, and this is the second component of what we wanted to talk about, meaning that we got to have the right test case. And those test cases must be more accurately managed in order to, uh, for us to A, promote reuse, and B, reduce this concept of bloat. So we, I have introduced a couple concepts here, and I know you guys have probably seen this chart before or something like this chart before, but it, it, it really uh, is going to be valuable if we spend a little time to cover it once more. But if we look at the percentage of test cases that you can execute along the top in your, in your traditional regression test suite, and we look at the risk coverage on the right, what you'll usually find is that by pure intuitive test design or tester intuition, you're going to get about 36% risk coverage by manually selecting the test cases that you want to execute in order to cover risk. The reason, primary reason why this is so low is because of test case bloat or regression suite bloat or repetitive test steps that are happening in the regression suite, meaning that you're, you're spending time exercising the same thing over and over again. But from a risk coverage perspective, it's not necessarily increasing your, your percentage of coverage, okay? And this is what happens with intuitive test design. 
when we start using assisted uh, test design um, with a solution that allows you to drive uh, the, the idea of what are the right tests, this increases significantly, right? So the idea here is we need to start using technology to assist us to achieve the mas maximum risk coverage with the minimal amount of powerful tests. And this is going to do two things. It's gonna increase reuse, number one, and it's number two, it's gonna reduce the maintenance overhead associated with keeping a regression suite relative and productive in terms of providing the organization risk coverage. So when you come down to it, the concept of continuous testing really has to do with design, selecting the right test cases, risk, making sure that those right test cases have an impact that is describable in business terms, and then reuse, really managing the concept of bloat and duplicative tests that are being generated throughout the life cycle. And with this combination, we are gonna be able to achieve speed, but more importantly, speed with a business insight. And this business insight is our ability to describe to the business not only the effectiveness of the job we're doing as testers, but also we're gonna be able to describe to the, to the ops people and the organization who's responsible for delivering the software whether we can move forward in a much, much more automated way. So I'm gonna spend a little time and I'm gonna give you the advanced view of how we get there through test case design and, and risk-based uh, planning. Uh, and, and by the way, forgive me because I'm gonna give you the extraordinarily short view of this. Um, there is a presentation on the Tricentis website uh, given by Ingo Philip, who does a fantastic job of explaining this in detail. Uh, I am gonna give you the Reader's Digest version, so forgive me, but I wanted to drive the point home on how we achieve this. So in your Agile uh, infrastructure, your agile management platform, you know, you have the idea of epics and themes and or themes and epics and user stories. Um, and, and this is a, a really interesting concept uh, because what it does is it actually produces a hierarchy of actual development work that gets put into more business oriented terms. So your themes have more business deliverable type descriptions to it. Your epics are a subcomponent potentially of those themes and the user stories actually get, get placed underneath those epics that are more granular uh, aspects of delivering that business concept. So as it turns out, your product backlog is a fantastic way to actually structure a hierarchical series of, of descriptions of the business facing application itself. Now this does not, this description does not have to marry the actual architecture of the project itself. Um, and by the way, that's actually a good thing because what we're actually doing in this uh, manner or in this process is actually giving the business a description of what's being delivered uh, from code or from your, your agile processes in a manner which is understandable to the business. So in terms of, let's say, this banking uh, app, which is securities trading, you have this idea of a capture order or a client-side validation. You're checking the eligibility, the suitability, the availability, uh, or validating the transaction itself. These are items that I believe the business are more, uh, more aligned to than potentially the architectural view of the application itself. The good thing about this is from this actual uh, product backlog or hierarchy of product backlog, you're gonna have multiple sprints associated with it, right? And mostly each one of those sprints or user stories within those sprints are going to actually have an association with each one of the uh, epics or themes that are on the left. So the idea here is that we have a good way to actually describe the business to the business. We just need to abstract that in a manner which we can translate it to testing. The interesting part though, is if you look at what we did when we, trans when we transformed to Agile, we really shifted our focus of testing. And what we did is we shifted it to much, much more of a bottom-up approach, which means that when you started testing against the user stories uh, and testing against the, the, these user stories within the two-week sprint, um, we were more focused bottom-up on the changing code base and we never necessarily tied that changing code base into 
what does it mean to the overarching application or user experience itself? That bridge or that connection seemed to be missing when we made our first volley into, into a much more agile or scaled agile environment. And this is really where this idea of bloat started because what happened was as we were testing each individual sprint, each user story began to have its own test and we started to duplicate actual tests uh, in scripts or code uh, and we started to test things over and over and over again, which bloated the test suite. Uh, this is interesting because that bloated test suite not only uh, produces no incremental value to the business, it also erodes your time to execute a broader set of tests. So bloat does two things from a negative perspective. It basically uh, reduces the, the, the number of tests you can run but it also reduces the value to the organization as the incremental value of what's being exercised isn't being presented back to the business. So if we shift to the product view on the left, what we really wanna do is now report on two things. We want to make sure we're reporting on the intermediate goals, which is making sure the changing code base is stabilized and the functionality associated with each user story is validated on the right. But we also want to make sure that those are translated seamlessly without additional work to the main goal, which is how is the product performing on the left, which is really described as your series of epics or themes in which the business can more readily consume. So this idea uh, on how we got so disconnected really came from this, this really centralized uh, uh, theme, which is there really was no central repository to actually build structure off of. And when we went to more of a distributed agile type uh, uh, development and agile testing framework, what we did is we started to build independent or siloed tests that didn't necessarily roll so conveniently back up into this product view. And this is what we need to solve with test or assisted or AI or ML or advanced test case design. So the goal here is that if you have these N number of sprints to make sure that the correlation is built or the traceability relationship is built back to the actual uh, theme or epic, in which case, this theme or epic governs the way that test cases are actually A, reused, or B, modified. So this is really where the concept of maintenance comes in, which is really cool. Meaning that instead of actually going in and rewriting a test case associated with each user story, we can actually reuse the tests that are already under this check availability sequence or, 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 or epic or theme, and reuse those components to exercise each one of the brand new user stories. And this is kind of cool because we know we got to expand that test and those updates get then pushed back into the central repository. So as Agile team number one makes these changes, those little test sequences or building blocks are then built back in to the central repository, which is cool because now each one of the Agile teams can draw off the central repository, reduce their effort associated with actually building new test cases, yet still deliver their changes to the centralized product view, which gives you both the ability to report on the immediate goals, which is the changing code base, and also report on the overall health of the product or the transaction itself. So this central repository is critical for expanding your design. The second part of the equation is risk. And from risk, the way we go about doing this is giving a relative business risk contribution to the, the overarching deliverable, which in this case is securities trading. So what we've said is capture order really has 80% of the risk and cancel order has 10% of the risk relatively. Um, and, and by the way, this is not a individual's uh, contribution. This is a team uh, sport, right? So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna distribute risk as a combination of a dev, test, and business team and understand the relative risks associated with each one of the elements we're, we're providing. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna be able to report. At that point, your business risk coverage report would look something like this. Uh, the 41% is the rolled up business risk coverage for this product view. And what it's saying is that 41% 
of your business risk is covered and passing by your test. It says 6% of your business risk is exposed and failing with the tests. 9% of your uh, business risk coverage is covered by tests but not executing. And what you have here in terms of the 45% is really what's called leakage. Which is, these are tests for your risk that is A, not being covered, B, there's no test associated with it. So therefore, C, it's, it's basically exposed or it's leaking. So how do we get there? We can get here if we use this methodology and report on any level associated with your, your product hierarchy itself, whether it's a product, an increment, a theme, an epic, a user story, or even a test case. This methodology can actually be decomposed to get you that answer. So how do we actually get to risk? So we have to have the concept of, of assigning priority to it. The first way we look at it is let's say we have two transactions. The one on the left here is a batch transaction, which has a thousand transactions associated with it. And those thousand transactions um, basically have a hundred dollars associated with it. The one on the right is a single transaction and it has a single uh, uh, unit associated with is a hundred US dollars. So the frequency of the transaction on the left is a high frequency, right? So we, we associate it with a scale of one to five. The frequency is a one. It's much, much higher uh, frequency associated with, um, uh, excuse me, the frequency on the, on the transaction on the left is less. So it's a one comparatively to the frequency of the transaction that happens on the right. So the batch process that happens on the left happens more infrequent compared to the frequency of the, of the transaction that happens on the right, which happens more frequently. However, the damage of the batch sequence, which has a, you know, a maximum uh, damage of $100,000, uh, is relatively more damaging than the $100 transaction on the right. So here we see that the damage class is five compared to the damage class of one on the transaction on the right. Given that, we use a logarithmic scale, uh, which is two to the power of the, the frequency and damage class, uh, and we calculate a relative weight of these two. And as you can imagine, when we use this particular, these things actually have equal weight um, because of frequency and damage class. But when we take that, uh, we also now have the ability to distribute the damage class uh, per the individual components of the product view versus the frequency class to come up with an absolute weight. And then what we do is we apply that absolute weight versus the business risk contribution. With that, we have now a really nice view of the relative risk associated with our product. And this can actually drive with the appropriate test case design the answer to the question, does the release have an acceptable level of risk? Um, I know that was short and fast. Um, we have a much, much more uh, detailed view of that on how to get there in our webinars, but I wanted to actually show you how you actually get there in a, in a real rapid, rapid manner. Um, the, also, the really cool thing about using these two uh, types of, of, of risk and design aspects in conjunction with themselves is it doesn't necessarily give you, uh, it not only gives you what should be tested, but the cool thing is it also shows you what you don't have to test. And that should probably be one of the more primary goals that we look at in software to testing today, uh, meaning that we should be much more focused on what we don't have to test in order for us to actually be more effective in, in doing what we need to do. So Charlene, I'm gonna ask one more question. And All given right. the fact that I posed pose this, this question of, you know, does the release have an acceptable level of risk? And I pose the way to achieve it through uh, advanced design and risk weighting. I want to ask you one more question. And this is, how is the one critical question answered today with your current process? Is it answered by an automated quality gate, meaning everything I just showed you is totally automated in terms of risk association and, and design and execution? Um, are the reports architected to give you these answers, but it requires human review? Or does it require a substantial manual effort to get there? Or do you have really no visibility into it? So let's throw that out as the last poll question. We'll then answer some questions and uh, we'll be done for the day. All right, great. So uh, the poll, polling question should be up on your screen now. 
We'll give everybody about 30 seconds or so to go ahead and make their decision. Um, uh, we are running up against the end of the hour, so I'm not quite sure we're going to actually have time for questions, but we'll uh, we'll see. Maybe we can slip one in. Um, but if we don't get to the questions, please know that uh, the folks at Tricentis will get a copy of all of the questions that are asked. So I am sure that uh, that Wayne and company will be more than happy to follow up with you offline. So um, looks like we have, um, yeah. We've got about uh, three quarters of folks uh, voting, so I'm going to go ahead and close it out now, and we'll uh, take take a look at the poll results. Sharing, whoop, uh, happened again. Sharing results right now. Okay, Wayne, can you see the poll results? If not, I'll I'll let you know what they say. Charlene, if you wouldn't mind, read them off. I, not, I, I, I think I I think I know where to click, but if I do, I'm afraid I'm going to click <laughs> off or something. I totally understand. Okay, how was the one critical question answered today with your current process? 49% uh, said it requires substantial manual effort. Second was we have no visibility into it at 20%, followed by it's answered by an automated quality gate at 17%, and finally reports are architected to deliver answer with human review at 15%. So pretty much half folks said it cool. uh, requires substantial manual effort. Very interesting, and, and I think that's the way I would expect it uh, today. So uh, thank you, uh, the people uh, who gave a poll. Hey, by the way, there are some questions that trickled in. I thought I would answer one of them that seems uh, really compelling, and then we'll call it a day, and uh, and then obviously invite you to download or re-look at this uh, presentation uh, on in on demand mode as well. And the one question that came in uh, that I just saw, uh, thank you very much, Cynthia, is that um, who decides the acceptable level of risk uh, in, of a release in the DevOps world? And, and this is where, I'm, honestly, this is really where the teams need to come together. And the communication between and among the teams is actually critical. Um, if I've, I've seen these things explode you know, kind of in the, in the idea that one team takes a lead and they establish the, the, the risk profile for a particular uh, product grouping or transaction set. And, and when the business doesn't necessarily understand the logic of what's happening there, the thing blows up. And then what happens is you create this even, this biggest, bigger chasm or a rift between the business and the technical team, um, meaning that uh, you get in this back and forth saying, you don't understand the business. And then the technical people say, well, you don't understand the complexity of what we're trying to deliver. So if it's not happening in a collaborative manner, uh, it's going to be a problem. Um, by the way, I see that there's a ton of questions, so it looks like mm -hmm. I'm going to have some homework to do tonight, uh, <laughs> and I, I I have no problem answering each and every one and responding back in email. Um, so with that, let me close and say thank you um, to the to the participants, and yeah. uh, and I really uh, look forward to seeing you on a future DevOps.com webinar. All right, great, thanks, Wayne. Um, I do before we close out, I I did promise that we would be doing a giveaway for five um, $50 Amazon gift cards. So I want to do that real quick and then um, do the closing comments. Our gift card winners are, thank you everybody for attending today. The first winner is Carolyn O'Connell. Congratulations, Carolyn. Second winner is Jack Liu, L-I-O-U. Congratulations, Jack. Third winner is Leonard Vaughn. The fourth winner, congratulations, Leonard. The fourth winner is Rajesh Gopalakrishnan, and I apologize if I uh, mispronounced your name, but congratulations, Rajesh. And the final winner is Richard Pietzer, I think it is, P-U-E-T-Z-E-R. Uh, congratulations, Richard. Congratulations to everybody won who won. And um, also want to remind the audience real quick that if today's, uh, today, that today's <laughs> Webinar has been recorded, so that's easy for me to say. If you missed any or all of it, you will be able, or if you just want to listen to it again, you will be able to do so. We will be sending out an email that contains a link to the webinar on demand. And as Wayne said at the beginning, the webinar is also going to be living on the DevOps.com website. So you can always find it there. Just go to the webinar section, click on On Demand, and it should be right there waiting for you. Also, um, Check out the other webinars that we have on the site. Hopefully there'll be uh, something there that piques your interest. Wayne, thanks so much for a great presentation. Loved it. My pleasure.
Thanks, everybody. Awesome. All right. Thank you to the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody.